Alan Mason is perhaps best known for mixing Hans Zimmer's work, including most recently the Dune soundtrack, but he has an incredible career story too. We met him at his studio to tell us his story, talk about mixing, and more. I started out as a as a trumpet player in high school. I was I was a good player. I was a musical guy, and I thought that what I really wanted from life was to be a classical trumpet player. But what I found out later on is, I would, if I had practiced all the time when I was supposed to be practicing, I might have had a shot. But by the time I got to college, there were so many young players that were so much better than me, and they weren't going to make it. And so I realized that, you know that wasn't gonna be a path for me. And I didn't know what I was gonna do. And I was at school in Brooklyn College and I was walking through the hallways uh, and I hear music and it was like the Pied Piper thing, you know? And I just started going towards the music. I peeked in the door and it's this studio, it's this sound studio and there's this little booth and I just looked in and there's this little mixing board and a glass look overlooking the theater and, and, um, and then an office with a piano and microphone set up. And then I hear, hi. It's like, oh, hi. Oh, what's up? I'm, I'm Alan. I'm just looking around. I don't know what's going, you know. And uh, it was this guy, Frank Angel, and, and uh, we had a conversation and he offered me an internship. So I started there. And honestly, the minute I realized I wasn't going to make it as a trumpet player, my interest in school was non-existent. So I, I was, on the best of days, I wasn't a great student, you know. On, on But once I got to that point, I just lost interest in going to school. So I only stayed a semester at the school, but I actually stayed a year as an intern at the studio. And then um, this amazing piano tuner, who I'll always be grateful to, Peter Crosby, passed away many, many years ago, told me that they were opening up a new studio in Midtown Manhattan to do TV and radio commercials called Counterpoint. He says, you should you know, give him a call and see if you can get an interview. So I did that and I got an interview and I showed up at 10 a.m. for a 1 p.m. interview, and I got the job. <laughs> but it was interesting because I, 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 I kind of, the minute I walked into a, a sound studio and, and now a recording studio, I realized that I have an aptitude for this. This is, I'm, I'm not looking at it going, oh my God, what do all those dials and knobs do? I'm like, oh, that it looks like it's doing that and that's doing that and that's how you get there. And oh, he's doing that for the headphones. And so it sort of just clicked in. So. I started as um, you know a toilet cleaner in in the studio, and it was a new studio, and they had had an assistant in there who wasn't maybe uh, as experienced as as she as she could have been, and it slowly became obvious that I knew you know I knew what I was doing and I could handle a session. So I started. I didn't. We both worked, and you know, I didn't try to overtake her or anything like that. I was young. I was at this point. I was eighteen or nineteen, and 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 um, I just started doing a lot of sessions. And what was amazing about it was doing jingles in New York in the seventies. Only the best players played, you know. So you're sitting there, and Steve Gadd's playing drums, or Will Lee is playing bass, and the Brecker brothers are in the horn section and stuff like that. So I got to kind of see and meet all my idols, you know, in the first session, which I still remember was a Volkswagen commercial called Art Dealer. <laughs> I couldn't sing it to you, but it was a little, and that was when the Volkswagen logo was Volkswagen does it again. And so I, we did like 30 of those. So that became a day to day thing. I was working with this amazing engineer named Gary Chester and assisting and we do, the, the great thing about learning in that world is from uh, 7 a.m. in the morning to 4 p.m. in the evening, you do the whole process. So you get there, you make coffee, you sweep the floors, you set up the microphones. The rhythm section comes, we record rhythm section, the rhythm section leaves, and then the strings come in, and then the brass comes in, and then the singers come in. It's like 2 o'clock at this point. You know, a group of singers, and they sing their Volkswagen does it again. Then they leave. Gary Chester mixes it almost magically fast. And uh, before you know it, I'm sending out what they call full coats and stripes for delivery, for it to be uh, duplicated, to be sent to radio stations and television stations, uh, rinse, repeat every single day. And for I did that for a year and it, I just, everything started becoming automatic. I, I, I started kind of using just my instincts to set up and stuff. And I started doing the headphone mixes for him, Gary immediately saw that I had something. So he was giving me a lot of room to learn and grow and take chances and stuff like that. And, and so I started doing the headphone mixes and then he would show up late and I'd start the mix. And then 
you know, I would do my sessions during the day, everyone would leave, and then at night I would bring in people I knew who were at Juilliard or, you know, and, and start recording them so I could learn how to record on my own terms, you know, and it was amazing. I had this opportunity to have the studio. The owner said you could use it anytime you want as long as we're not on a session. You would wake up in the morning and show up. So I did that and, and that took me for two years doing that with Gary. And then one July 4th, 1979, uh, there's a Belgian artist that was coming in with this producer, Mark Ariane. And it was July 4th and they wanted to do a vocal session and no one wanted to do it. And I'm like, I'll do it, you know, I'll do anything, you know. So I, I got, they put me on this session, I did it. It worked out well. I did a rough mix that they loved. I, I've always had a pretty good instinct with mixing. Even when I didn't know what I was doing, I always could put together a balance that kind of worked, you know. So I did this mix and he offered me a job in Belgium. So I give up my job, I move to Europe for six months and I work in the studio in the outskirts of the outskirts of Brussels. And, and uh, but funnily enough that I got to record a Chet Baker album and I got to hang out with Chet Baker and do all that stuff. So these life experiences were just incredible. And um, I eventually got fired because I deserved to get fired. And, and uh, I tried to come back and then I came back to LA and I went back to my old job and got fired from that. You know, it's like, as, as I gained more stuff, I, it was hard to go back. And um, from there, I, I mean, I, I, not to go into the real, you know, minutia of it, I ended up at the Hit Factory uh, because I was working at RCA Records and the engineer there was leaving and going to the Hit Factory and he took me with him. So I went to the Hit Factory for two years. I got to hang out with John Lennon. I got to start learning how to make records, which was completely different because you didn't do everything like that. You spent the day on a drum sound. In, in the 70s, you spent the day on a drum sound. And, and, you know, it was just a whole different mindset. And I started thinking more about sound in a more abstract way. You know, when I was working with Gary, Gary was the greatest engineer at getting a fast sound that works all the time. But he's not a guy that's going to put up a couple of room mics and add some compression and see what that sounds like with the delay on it and so on and so forth and flange. That wasn't who he was. So now I was working at the Hit Factory with uh, engineers like Chris Kimsey and Ed Sprigg and and these guys are like bringing in garbage cans with leaves in them and doing that and making a loop out of it. We made, I remember we made um, our own Mellotron. We took a piece of 24 track tape and we got the singer in and she sang two octaves of chromatic scale. And just by how you put the faders up, you could build chords. And then it's like early sampler. You build the chord, you record it to two track, you put back up the multi-track that you need and you fly it into where you want it. So I had mad tape skills. I just was really, really good at flying stuff around and I was having the time of my life, you know? And then I went to A&R Studios because that was owned by Phil Ramone or not, no longer owned by Phil Ramone at that point. Um, I was one generation away from Elliot Shiner. So I was assisting his assistants and they got me because I, now I had this record experience, but I also had this jingle experience and they were doing a lot of jingle work. So I went there and I was there for about a year and uh, I got fired for gross neglect. And I thought my career was over. And right as I got fired, almost like it was meant to be this, this client of a &R, this guy, Roger Tallman, who I worked with as an assistant, called me up, he goes, you don't happen to be able to do engineering work, do you? He says, you were really great, and I, I really feel like you were the, the backbone of that session, and we have this Cadillac campaign, and I was wondering if you'd like to record and mix it. And it's like, uh, yeah, I mean, oh, let, let me check my schedule. <laughs> so I became a freelance engineer just almost by default. And I've never had a job since then. I've been freelance. The closest I've had to that is I'm sort of the, the uh, de facto chief engineer of remote control, but I'm not really, you know, I'm not paid by them. I, it's just something I do. Through that process, I started uh, working with uh, the kind of dance music world in New York at the time, just again, because I did a rough mix that, some, that Arthur Baker liked, you know? So I went to work for Arthur and I was, I was the night guy 
at Shakedown Sound and uh, Andy Wallace, who went on to you know produce Nirvana and stuff like that. He was the day guy, and it was a 24-hour cycle there. So I was you know working from like 11 to 10, and then he would come in, and we'd, we'd work all the time, and I got to work with all these amazing producers. So I'm like, well, I, maybe I'm going to go in the record business. And I started mixing, and I did. Uh, I was working a lot for Tommy Boy Records, and they liked me, so she... Monica Lynch introduced me to Brian Ferry. And uh, I. they said, they asked me to do a couple of remixes for him. So I did these remixes. And then now I'm working, you know, this is a couple of years now. I'm I'm, I'm well into my career, you know. And, and uh, jokingly around, I said to Brian's assistant, this guy Simon, I said, if he, because I knew he had mixed the album three times already, you know. And I said, if he wants to mix it a fourth time, tell him I'd be happy to do it, you know. And so... The next day, he's like, uh, Alan, this is Brian Ferry. And first, I'm like, okay. He's like, I love the mixes you did. I understand you would like to mix the album. Would you Would you feel, would you want to mix it? So I said, sure. So I did it for like $15,000. And I spent $17,000 on gear to do it. That's where I was at. I was like, I'm, and I put notes up everywhere. You know, uh, nothing's impossible. No limitations, you know. And just sort of like trying to convince myself that this was going to be okay. I really didn't know. And of course, Bob Clearmountain had mixed the previous Brian Ferry record and Roxy Music's Avalon and, and, and. And all of a sudden here I come in. So I'm like, well, I can't do what he did. So let me do it with my own style. And I did it like a dance record. And people liked it and sold very well. you know. And, and through that, I started getting a lot of more remix work. And I ended up working with New Order. And I did that, and that went very well. And I started doing a lot of uh, R&B, Polygram. I did this group, Cameo, you know, very popular group in the in the 80s. And um, I um, worked with them, and the, the A&R guy that, like, that was representing them liked me and started giving me other work. And I started working with, like, Nia Peoples and Jody Watley and Howard Hewitt and Keith Washington and... And I, my clientele started building up, and I was doing quite well. And and I was living, working on both coasts, so I decided to move out to L.A., okay? So I'm, I'm figuring if I'm going to be on both coasts, I can either live above a pizza place or I could live on the beach and look at Brazilian girls in their bikinis. Now, remember, I'm 28 at this point, so it's like there was a, it was a no-brainer, you know? I bought myself a Jeep, took the top off, and that was my lifestyle. And it was it was awesome until it wasn't, you know? And... and it, it was easy at first, and then it got harder and harder, and it became a real grind. And I realized that, you know, the, the level of competition in, you know, they in mixing records, you know, the people I was competing with, the Chris Lord Algies and the and the Bobs, and and uh, you know, it was before the Manny Americans and the you know Mas, Tony Maserati who assisted me. Um, so this was like early, still mid '80s and stuff like that. And and I did well with it, and I was trying to do it, but I, I wasn't really loving it, and I really felt like an imposter. I don't know. It, was, it wasn't for me, and then I had a situation where a client just didn't show up for like 12 hours, so it finally left after 12 hours, and as he's pulling up, and he goes, you're fired, and I said, that's fine with me. And, and I really just made a decision that this is, I'm not going to do this. And... Uh, I had a period of time where I, I went through all of my money. I ran out of money. You know, I took my retirement fund and paid my mortgage and stuff like that. And I had no idea to what, what I was going to do. I was going to apply to chiropractic college. And then uh, this young guy who I used to help get internships uh, ended up in an internship at here at Media Ventures at the time, as it was called. And I asked him who, who's Hans's engineer. And he told me I, who's a guy I knew from New York. So he said, hey, tell Jay I say hi. So he did that, and they called me. And they said, hey, why don't you stop by? And so I stopped by, and, and uh, they showed me around. And I said, look, if you ever need anyone to cover f for anything, I'm happy to do it. And two days later, they called me, and I did a session. And, and, uh, and then they asked me to just come visit the Lion King recording session to see, you know, they wanted to see if, how I, you know, so I did that, and um, that's my first time I met Hans, actually, outside. He, he's like, he was smoking a cigarette, and I was smoking a cigarette. 
He goes, I can't believe I can't smoke on my own session. You know, it was like the first thing he ever said to me. And, uh, and then they, they asked me to, uh, they actually asked me to do a session with Hans. And uh, it was on a Saturday. It was with Penny Marshall. It was for this movie, Renaissance Man. And it was a percussion thing. And I said, sure, okay. I'll, I, I usually didn't do sessions if they called me the day before because it makes you look too available. But in this point, I was actually quite available and really had no idea what I was going to do. So I figured I'd hang out with Hans Zimmer for a day. What? How bad would that be, right? And Penny loved me. She loved me. I'm from Brooklyn. I'm you know, Jewish. I'm everything so so she's in the back and she's like she goes that sounds good and smacks me in the back of the head and all that stuff and hans is laughing right so then he leaves and i th i thought i pissed him off i must just you know i i have a outgoing personality and and uh it's easy for me to put my foot in my mouth and i thought i put my foot in my mouth and he left and i finished the session myself and then i get a call the next day can you come in and i'm like ah oh, they're gonna they're gonna give me a check for one day's work and read me the riot act and they come in and Hans is like, why don't I know you? You know, and uh, he said, what are you doing for the next two months? And that was Renaissance Man. And I helped finish up Lion King. And then that two months turned into nine months, you know, the, the, the movie nine months and the movie as good as it gets and the movie, you know, something to talk about. And it just on and on and on and on and on. And I became part of the fabric of this place. So it was a very different environment then it was a much smaller group of people now it's quite large but it's you know at that time it was me hans his his assistant and uh, a studio chief and one tech and that was it so and i was single and i as, once i realized what this world was i was like this is for me you know this is perfect for me i'm a trumpet player they're asking me to read scores that i can do you know, I can hear in an orchestra what's working and what's not working. And I turned out to really have a high level of skills when it came to recording orchestras, which I, I probably developed from doing jingles, you know. And uh, it just worked out great. And, and um, so it became a long-term relationship. And then when Hans became the head of DreamWorks Music and we did Gladiator and we did uh, the first uh, animated feature was Ants and then the next one was Prince of Egypt. The, it, it all just started to build up and you know I'm, I'm, I had a movie that won an Academy Award for Best Sound Mixing, Speed, and then Gladiator won and you know and I just started having this career and then I started getting outside work from other people and stuff like that. Fast forward to now and uh, this, what you see is what that gave me. I just happened to have a skill set that Hans was looking for at that point. How to make his stuff. I mean, honestly, Hans is so good at what he does. He's actually a fine mixer that to, to give some added value, you have to bring something to it. So, you know, I decided at this point, I'm just going to do what I do and see what happens. You know, I wasn't going to be squeamish about it. And, and he liked it, you know, not always. And, and a lot of times he would shoot me down, but he'd rather have the ideas than to not have, you know, than just be throwing a ball at a rubber, you know, at a rubber wall, you know. So I was giving him stuff to do, and most of the time I was doing well. My favorite Han story is, um, you know, he would, in the early days, he would come in and mix with me. Now, of course, he doesn't, but um, I don't remember what, what the score was, but he writes these big, long suites that sort of, you know, um, indicates what all the melody things, and we record it, and it's a you know, it ends up on the soundtrack album most of the time. So I had this like eight minute one, and I was mixing it for like a day and a half because that's the thing I spend the most time on. And he comes in, and usually he comes in, we listen to like half of it, then he stops, and we start doing some automation and stuff. But he's listening, and he's listening, and he's listening, and then it stops, and he sits there for a second, he pulls out his wallet, and hands me a dollar, and walks out. In other words there's nothing to change. So I ran after him. I said, sign this dollar. And so that is in my studio at home on the wall. And every time I think I'm an imposter, I look at that dollar. It reminds me, well, at least at that point in time, I wasn't an imposter. <laughs> the, the technical differences between music that is cinema bound and music that is going to be played in a home cinema is really about scale. You know, it's about the fact that in a, in a cinema, you have so much more air and space 
and Lowen sort of acts a little bit differently and and everything. But the problem is that I'm mixing it in a small space. You know, even if I had a, a much bigger room, it's still unless I'm mixing in a theater. So what I tend to do for you know large motion pictures is I'll put, I'll do a couple of mixes and I'll go to the stage and listen to it and sort of gear myself as to what it is sounding like there and maybe I need more surrounds or maybe the low end isn't for this th theater is is too big or not big enough or stuff like that but um you know in in, in my um in when it leaves here my goal is that it's going to work in any surround environment that it's in you know it, it it is different and if I know if say for example I'm doing television you know, then I'm not worried about that larger soundscape. I'm, I'm more interested in like really hearing it in the environment that it is. And that, in that case, I'll listen to it, I'll mix it and surround it, and then I'll put it through the television speakers and listen to see how it's translating through that. In video games, I have a little video game um, speaker system in the other room. And when I do video games, I do a lot of video games. Um, uh, I'll listen through that. So it's more just listening to it in the delivery that is probably going to end up being heard by 90% of the people. You know, uh, I was a good recording engineer. I'm still a good recording engineer, so I could get a decent rhythm section sound. Um, and it all sounded great. But until you get into the world of film, you don't understand. It, it's all different, you know. And certainly in record production, everything needs to be, like, up front and everything needs to be louder than everything else you know and and so that is you know i worked on that and then i tried to develop my style where i had a little bit more depth than other people and i had varying success with that um but in the film world it's you're in this large immersive environment with this 100 piece orchestra or, or 40 piece orchestra or whatever it is on a good scoring stage that has a good sound signature, you're almost recording the room more than you're recording the individual instruments. So you sort of, the way I look at it, I have three perspectives. I have, well, four actually. I have the room, which is my decatry configuration and a couple of what they call outriggers. And they're all somewhere between nine and a half and 12 feet, you know? And then um, I have a mid distance, which is an individual mic above each section whatever it is the strings one strings the violence one violence two viola celli bass french horns brass percussion you know like that and then the then there's the spot miking which is actually the closer mics which i try to avoid using too much in a film but i end up using it more than i should and then the uh you know nowadays with everything you know we always record everything with an atmos you know mic array set up so that we can always if they if they need it in atmos they i can do it and those are just basically higher up you know it's 16 feet is usually where i have that and depending on what the score is it, it really i listen to the music that we're doing and i decide does this want to be like classically orchestral or is this something that needs to be sort of stylized in a way that's you know if you listen to for example italian job it's a score movie but the score doesn't really sound like you know a john williams score so i take that into account am i doing like i just did this thing at abbey road for this video game jedi fallen order which is eight hours of music 210 cues massive job all live and it that that is how they wanted it to sound so in this case i'm, I'm just trying to take this recording i did and just detail it in a way that makes it as as clear as it can be and as powerful as it can be and still give it the Allen edge. But when I'm doing something that's a little bit more hybrid, I, I will, um, you know, be less worried about the, the orchestra sounding legit and just have fun with it. You know, like I'll put up mics that I know I'm going to distort, you know, like I'll put a stereo ribbon mic up above the conductor and I'll, I'll just route that, I'll record it with a lot of compression and maybe a thermionic culture vulture on it or something like that or overdrive in LA-2A or something and, you know, and do that. And I just have that and I, and I commit to it because I don't want to have to think about it later. I don't, I don't want that to be part of my mixing process. So I just have this little fader that I can turn up some dirt if I need it 
on an orchestra or a brass section or, you know, just unconventional stuff like that. The final delivery for me actually isn't at most regularly unless there's a specific request for it. And the reason they do that is because the, 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 um, when I commit to an Atmos mix in this environment, I'm not taking into account the final mix of the sound effects. So I can create conflicts and problems and I'm limiting the better dubbing mixer to being more creative with, with the positioning in the Atmos environment of the music. So for example, on Dune, Ron Bartlett, who's sort of been my partner for you know 25 years, he's, he's as close as I have to a brother. We even look alike. And he's a, he just won the Academy Award for Dune. He's a world-class mixer. I don't mind delivering him anything because I know that when I go hear it in the cinema, it's going to sound great. And he's not, he's not a fix-it in his mix kind of guy. I go there and I look at, at my stems that I delivered him and there's, no, there's not a ton of EQ on it. There's not, he's not adding reverb everywhere and everything. He's just being very like careful about positioning and stuff like that. So I can respect that. And that to me is a very effective way to do Atmos because you know, the way, the way Ron and I do it is we basically build f four boxes. We build a ground level box and that's just basically the bed, 7.1 bed, which actually we don't use the bed for, we use objects because early on Atmos days, there was a latency between the bed and objects. Um, and sometimes I use the bed. Uh, and then the next one is, you know, imagine it being set 20% higher and in the front. And the next one is 20% higher than that and in the middle. And then the last one is at the top and more in the back. And that way you could just set up your session so that you have four different outputs. You could just pop between ground level one, two, three, and see where this works best. Very simple. And I'm not doing a lot of object automation. You know, I do sometimes if, if, if it's, something that's fun and effective and, and right for the score. But I'm not a guy that's trying to, you know, it, I wouldn't be a good guy to mix stuff for Atmos, you know, the, this, uh, references because I, I'm trying to keep it as just an immersive experience as opposed to, you know, just think of it like this. If you're doing a movie, the one thing you don't want to do is have someone turn their head, right? You don't want them doing that when they're watching a movie. So if I have a sound like zipping around like that, that's not connected to something on the screen, it's going to be very disconcerting. It's going to be very distracting. So, you know, yes, when something's on the screen and it passes by and it, it's a musical element or something, I can do that, you know, but I, I'm very, very careful with that. And that's better done on the stage with the sound effects, with them doing it and having the time to do it right. That's all for now. If you like what you saw, please be sure to like and share it and subscribe and click the bell icon so you know when we upload new content to our YouTube. Also find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Thanks for watching.